a lot of people ask me, what podcast do I listen to? And the reality is I listen to very, very few. There's only a handful of like great podcasts out there. One of them though, and one of my favorite podcasts ever is the Jordan Harbinger show. I've got Jordan with me. Jordan, how's it going? Hey, thanks for having me on, man. Jordan, I recently listened to your podcast, How to Ask for Advice. Brilliant podcast. I had a bunch of friends listen to it. Why don't you summarize that one for us? Well, in this day and age of epidemics, I would say that asking for advice in a really terrible way is also kind of a, well, maybe less harmful epidemic, but long term, it does a lot of damage because I always get folks that are saying things like, hey, can we meet up? I want you to mentor me. Right. It's like they're not asking you for help. They're kind of giving you a homework assignment for them. Right. Like, oh, okay. So you want to, you want me to like sit down with you because you don't have any specific questions now and just outline some sort of curriculum for you to be successful in this project that you're doing or in this career that you're doing because you haven't even bothered to figure out what it is that you're getting stuck on. You don't even have enough education to get to the actual question. So it's just my it's just my job now to make sure you're successful. I'm not signing up for that. And I'm sure as heck not going to take a meeting in the middle of my workday to then sign up for that. So I, I love how in this podcast, you basically recommend ways for people to give advice. And it was unique and counterintuitive in some ways. I highly encourage people to listen to not only that episode, but you always have such a unique twist on all of your topics. All your guests are great. And again, I highly recommend the Jordan Harbinger show. Thanks, James. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher show. Today on the James Altucher Show. If I was going to put together a framework for how I should act during this lockdown, we don't yeah. know how long the lockdown is going to last. Like, I think the economy might reopen, but there still might be heavy social distancing, quarantining, mm-hmm. mini lockdowns, personal yeah. lockdowns, you know, self-isolating. So while I'm home for this extended period, what are like the five things I can do to, to really up my game, enhance my brain. Let's do it. Absolutely. So the master question I want everyone to ask is just, as we begin with the end in mind, is we are going to come out of this eventually. Nobody knows how long it's going to be, right? But what's the story you want to tell about this time? Mm. And we are writing that story every single moment with every single decision and choice that we're making right now. So if you fast forward to six months from now, a year from now, how are you going to tell people what this time was like. And so the the five things that I would focus on in terms of choice in no particular order is clarity. This is a wonderful time to reset and reevaluate. I think self-awareness is a superpower. I think that's part of the reason why we're here as the human experience is, is discovering more about ourselves. And this is a nice time to in solitude for self-reflection. But, but Jim, let me, let me ask, like, let's say, um... I, let's say I'm worried about my job or let's say yeah. I'm worried about my family's health or whatever. And I'm, my brain's kind of been fixated. Like mentioned earlier, it's been hijacked. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it might be difficult for me to kind of switch channels on the brain. Like how do I, how do I do that? Third time on the podcast in the past six years is one of my first guests. And now my latest guest Jim Quick, who is, I I can't, Jim, first off, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Thank you, everyone who's listening. And Jim, I looked at the, all the praise you got for your book. So your, your book that um, is about to come out, we'll have you on again for the book, but the book that is about to come out is called Limitless. Uh, Jim, do you want to say what the subtitle is? I always forget subtitles. it's, It's all good. It's uh, limitless. Upgrade your brain, learn anything faster, and unlock your exceptional life. And and what we're going to talk about in this uh, little episode is f- five brain enhancing techniques while you're sitting at home during this quarantine slash lockdown. But first, I want to ask you about some of the um, quotes I am seeing from these amazing people in you know the the quote section or the, the blurb section of your book, like Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod, 
is calling you like, uh, let me, let me see if I can find the quote here. Uh, it, Jim quick is a personal trainer for your brain. He coached my team on accelerating learning strategies to da, 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 da. Uh, and then you have, um, S Stan Lee, the, one of the founders of all my favorite superheroes. He's the creator of all my favorite superheroes. He gives you huge praise. Steve Aoki, the amazing, uh, DJ, when it comes to learning faster and keeping your mental game strong, Jim quick is the guy, uh, you've got all these amazing quotes. How did you, how did you get all these? How did that happen? Um, very, 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 um, honored to have worked with those individuals that you have mentioned. I'm a brain coach of sorts. I don't really know a label for what I do. It's my 28th year of teaching. You'd think I'd have this kind of dialed in. But as people, as singers have a voice coach or um, entrepreneurs have a financial or marketing coach, athletes have personal trainers. I want to be a trainer or a coach for your brain. And what that means is really having becoming mentally fit and applying it towards learning faster, improving your memory, improving your focus, improving your, your critical thinking abilities, being able to read faster and uh, everything that would fall into this category of these mental superpowers in the, in the spirit of Stanley. It, it, it's, it's so, it's so interesting because, and we're going to talk about it a lot more in our, in our podcast about your book, uh, limitless, but, uh, and by the way, I love the title. It, one of my favorite movies in the past 10 years was <laughs> limitless with Bradley Cooper. I probably watched it five times. I wish there could be a limitless pill, but your, your, your book is the pill and you're going to describe these techniques, but. Uh, what I'm curious about, we're, we're, we're both doing this remotely, this podcast, and everybody's been in lockdown for a coronavirus. What do you do just before we get into all the stuff about your book? What do you do just to keep the brain sharp? And, and, you know, I, I, you and I have similar philosophies. Like I sort of feel it, the brain and creativity and, and mental performance is, is a muscle and you have to exercise it mm -hmm. and you have to exercise it correctly. Like if I just go down to the gym and lift weights, I'll probably end up in the hospital. But if you, have, if I had a good <laughs> trainer, if I had a good guide, I could, I could get stronger. So, so the same tools that can make you stronger can also really hurt you if you, if not used correctly. So I'm just curious, like coronavirus lockdown, mm -hmm. we're, we're all, not only is it, we're, not only are we just told to stay home from work, that's not really the issue because if that was it, then we'd all be happy and we'd be taking a vacation. But there's so much uncertainty in the world that there's a lot of fear. And that's that's way, it's not just, oh, this is the time to be productive. Everyone says, everyone says on their podcast, this is the time to be productive, be creative, learn a skill. It's not so easy when you're stressed out of your mind or, or you know, there's going to be 30 million people unemployed. So these people are not... Yeah. Th thinking, oh, well, now I better enhance my brain. I guess I just got fired. And now's the perfect time for me. So sure. what, what, what do you tell these people? Like, how can I, how I, I let's say I want to improve and maximize my brain potential during this period in a way that I couldn't have otherwise. What would you tell me? How would you, you're, you're my trainer right now. <laughs> okay. So the metaphor that I would use right now, and you and I are both in New York city. So it's one of the more intense areas, uh, that we're, we're experiencing I, I, the metaphor I use is we're going through a, a metamorphosis. It doesn't it feel that way that we're cocooning, right? We are cocooning. We're literally physically distancing ourselves from others. We are socially isolating ourselves. And in this cocoon, it, it, we're alone with, with our thoughts. We're alone with our fears. We're alone with our doubts. We are, we feel lonely. And those, those feelings, um, whether they can be valid because of what's going on in the world, they could also place a limit and hold us back from the next cycle well, of change. Well, let, let me, let, can I ask you about that? About, cause I, I think that actually is a, a really good metaphor and I haven't really thought of it that way because, and I think you're right. I think, I, I think that's the first thing is to slightly think about it this that way as a cocoon. Uh, and the reason I don't think of it that way as much is because I feel kind of attached to the global anxiety that is happening. Yeah. Not necessarily that, I mean, I guess my anxiety levels up just like everyone's probably, but like you say, being in New York city, being in the news flow, uh, I just feel it's hard to disconnect as much as I would like in order to do that rejuvenation. 
Yeah, and I would love people to be able to get there and be able to to be creative and be able to uh, to contribute and and self care. But it's it's hard because we're always we're hearing about physical hygiene, washing your hands and sanitizing everything, but we're not hearing a lot about mental hygiene and the way point. the brain. Yeah, the, the way the brain is, is set up, you know this, is just it's meant to, to protect ourselves. So, so we have to pay attention to what's threatening because that's our that's our survival. And you know the mantra in media that if it bleeds, it leads. And one of the challenges is, and I see this in myself, and I see this in people close to me, family and friends, that we could sometimes overindulge in in the media. And I'm not just not to say that we shouldn't be paying attention. Absolutely. The metaphor that I use is, uh, and I obviously use a lot of metaphors, uh, whether it's a butterfly or it's, uh, in this case, maybe a thermometer, a thermostat, where a thermometer, it the functionality, it reacts to the environment. And as human beings, we, naturally, we do react to things. It's, it's, I don't even know how realistic it would be to not react to what's going on, not react to the what's going on in the economy, not react uh, to to the fear, to the climate, to everything. And... I feel like the transition or we could spend a little bit more time identifying less with a thermometer reacting to things and more as a thermostat, where a thermostat, it, it doesn't react to the environment, it gauges the environment so it knows what temperature it is, but then it always wants to, it could set, the, it mm. could set a, a new temperature and, you know, in this case for people who are listening, you know, we could set Still, we can still set goals. We can still set vision and make the environment more what's inside our imagination. You know, in the, in the book Limitless, it's not about being perfect. It's about progressing and advancing, you know, especially beyond what we currently believe is possible. Well, so 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 I like this metaphor of and this distinction between a thermometer and a thermostat, because I think I and and I'm I'm speaking for myself, but maybe other people could relate, is that everybody loathes uncertainty. We'd even rather have mm -hmm. bad news than uncertainty. And there's a lot of uh, behavioral science studies that demonstrate that, that children will opt for a certain dollar, you know, $1 now versus $2, an uncertain $2 later, even if the expected value is greater than a dollar. And, you know, in the stock market, you could see simply the fact that we don't know, you know, what the blah, 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 growth rate, contagion rate, all these things about this coronavirus. If we knew those things, and if we knew, for instance, oh, people are going to die, but it's going to be like a flu. It's not going to be millions. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. If we had more certainty, even about bad news, I think the stock market would probably not have behaved the way it has. And that's kind of a barometer of, of the world psychology. So how do I, how do I go about, mm -hmm. I can't just think, oh, I'm going to set my thermostat. I have to set the thermostat I right. have to do something yeah i mean i think this awareness first of having having a framework or a paradigm of looking at something is a nice a nice uh first step is is being aware that th there's a quote in the book i i quote a french philosopher that says life is the c between the b and the d life is the c between the b and the d i love that and they're thinking jim is speaking in tongues and code <laughs> B stands for birth, D stands for the other side, yes. death, and C stands for choice. And it's a reminder that we have difficult times right now. They could, they could diminish us, they could define us, or they could develop us. We, we ultimately are going to decide. And these decisions, I mean, our life in a way is the sum total of all the choices we've made up to this point. And even though, you know, we didn't individually create, you know, what's going on, you know, uh, I don't think a victim mentality where we're just reacting is, is as useful. It's, it's not, for me, it's not about what's true. For me, it's these ideas in, in the book, which I know we're, we'll talk about in, in another episode, I talk about lies. And a lie for me is a limited idea entertained because obviously I have to iterate and acronyms everything to make it memorable. What's an example of a limited idea? A limited idea when it comes to, to what I focus on in learning is something like we only use 10% of our brain, right? And that's propagated through, you know, movies such as the names of my, my book and other other things where you're only using a small percentage because science 
is saying that we actually use actually well, most of our brain like we use most of our body. Right. And so part of the book is about transcending. It's about ending the trance. It's about ending this mass hypnosis of things, these limiting beliefs or ideas that we picked up. And we weren't necessarily born with them. You know, for you, people who know my story or listen to prior episodes with you know that I had learning challenges and a traumatic brain injury and, and these kind of things that I was labeled broken by a teacher, literally. And uh, that became my identity. But I wasn't born with that. It was, you know, those, the, the, the things that bind us often are imprinted on us by other people's expectations, by our experience, by uh, our environment. And so a lie is not necessarily something that's, uh, I'm not even thinking about as true or not true. It's something we give energy to and we have certainty. And just like you say, the, the human brain needs certainty. People will stay in a relationship that's uncomfortable, but it's certain, you know, and they won't change or they'll stay at a certain level of health or finances or a job that they maybe don't love because the uncertainty of starting their own business and going out on their own, um, is, is, is threatening. You know, you're so, you're so right. Like, I think, I think there's this constant grasp, this grasping for certainty, even when it might not be productive. So for instance, everybody hanging on to the latest word of, you know, how many deaths are there? How, what's going mm -hmm. on in Italy now? How are the hospital? How, what's, are, do we have enough ventilators in New York? Like, I think people are grasping onto any Thing of certainty and i think a key part of creativity and and learning is being able to live in um a, a, a period of uncertainty and and maybe that's the first step in setting the barometer is is to kind of step back from trying to find certainty what would be a good way to do that one one of the ways is first of all knowing that choice and decision coming back to that power you know, you mentioned Stan Lee, and uh, you know, you, I mentioned on a previous episode that Stan taught me an important lesson. And one time I was taking him out to dinner and we're in the car and I asked him who his favorite superhero was. And he said, Iron Man. And uh, I was like, I was fascinated by that. And, and he asked me, Jim, who's your favorite superhero? And I said, Spider-Man, because he was wearing a Spider-Man tie. And that's the one I grew up with. And without it, without a pause in his, in his trademark voice, he goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I, re I tend to reverse things in my mind. I don't know if it's because of my, my traumatic brain injuries or something, but I, uh, I, I heard something different and I checked myself and I was like, Stan, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. When we take responsibility for our circumstances in life, it's like, you know, whatever happened in the past, it's happened. There's nothing that we could do. But when we take responsibility for things right now, whether we are the cause or not, it gives us at least the autonomy and the agency to make things better. Because what's the what's what's the opposite of that? It's just having no influence, no control over our lives. And so, um, you know, I also think when we're talking about certainty, you can get it through small, simple steps. You don't have to make these big dramatic changes because that's hard because the human brain, again, is, re is wired for survival. It's not really wired for growth. You know, you have to exert effort and, you know, an intention and discipline uh, to be able to make change because, you know, the nervous system wants it to have that certainty. And even people around you, you see this all around that even if you are trying to learn and you listen to podcasts and you read books, some of the people around you are, are the ones that hold you back because you give them the power to do so because they like things staying the same also. And they don't want to see you change. I, Jim, I think, I think that's totally right. I think anytime you make a massive change in your life, there's always people who either discourage you or even go further. They say, you can't do that. And I always think the more people who tell me I can't do something, that's kind of a, a signpost that I'm probably going in the right direction. Not a hundred percent of a signpost, but yeah, usually like a that. good indication. And, and you make another point, which is that intention is very important because again, if I want to change, I can't just, um, I can't just think to my, you know, a, a, a drug, a drug addict can't just think to himself, that's it. I'm stopping. They have to actually right. go to meetings or, or have a, a, a partner or a sponsor or whatever. They have to actually do things and, and move, move environments, stop hanging out with the same people and, and so on. So, and, and, you know, you mentioned BJ Fogg earlier, he's a great proponent of building 
he even wrote a book called Tiny Habits, which, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to learn how to floss your teeth, just start flossing one tooth and then build up. So, okay, like if I want to yeah. change now, if I want to kind of re re reduce my addiction to certainty in this horribly uncertain period, yeah. what's what's the one, one of the choices I can make or what are some of the choices yeah. I can make right now? Okay, so know that the the brain is trying to preserve you and and it rather keep you certain rather than put you in a place that's unfamiliar because that is perceived as a threat. It's not a saber tooth tiger, but we act as if. It's just like the conversations you and I have had about stand up. You know, I am a you know I speak in front of two hundred thousand people live every single year, but this idea of getting in front of a, a group of people in a club and and like do a set for like five or ten minutes that that gives me an uncertainty. I could feel it's it. Terrifying. Being, yes, and then so how did you get past that? Because I I know we've known we've been friends for quite some time, and that transition, like how did you get over that lack of certainty? Any time. Any time, uh, it's a good question because when I was first, someone asked me, "Hey, do you want to do uh, a stand-up set?" I was terrified, and so again, that terror was a signpost for me because obviously, sta going on a stage and standing in front of forty or fifty strangers and doing comedy is not going to. I'm not in the jungle being chased by right. lions. Nothing's going to happen in those five minutes. I'm going to be physically safe. I'm going to be even reputation safe because no one knows who I am. They're just a bunch of strangers or tourists or whatever. And anytime I felt that terror as regards stand up, uh, it only meant I should do it. So, for instance, if mm. I was given a choice, uh, hey, do you want to go up before Bill Burr, who's one of the best comedians in the world, or do you want to go up right after Bill Burr? Going up right after one of the most famous comedians in the world is terrifying because the audience really doesn't care about you at that point. They're all so excited that they just saw Bill Burr. So I would always take the choice that was the scariest. I would go after him because I knew that would also help me learn the fastest. You know, mm. or or if they would say, "Hey, do you want to go up?" Um, you know, there's all sorts of different parts of a lineup. Like, if do you want to go up when the waiter or waitress is giving the checks? To everyone that's called the check spot and that's the most difficult spot because everyone's figuring out the check so i would always <laughs> i would always try to go on the check spot even though that's usually the beginner spot because no the 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 more people who have been doing it longer don't want to go on it during that spot and they have they've earned the right not to but i would always choose to to go on that spot anything that will help me learn faster and, and anything that gave me terror i would i would do plus i loved it so that kept me going through the terror yeah, and that's good. You said, and when we when we have this other conversation about the limitless model, part of it is to do with human motivation and having reasons and and the feelings that come with that. But I, I would say that it's interesting because you take these small, simple steps. And uh, I, I actually have uh, had you know both BJ and James Clear and these experts on habits on on my podcast, and we had these conversations. And I cite some of their work in here. But I, I would say that you do difficult things uh, because it gives you, you know, on the other side of it, you know, the brain, again, wants to keep you safe. So going into unfamiliar areas, even though you're physically safe on that stage, it feels very different. Yeah, and it's, so, it's right, terrifying. Yeah, right. And the stage right now that we are globally, you know, stepping outside, there's this fear. And just to so understand how the brain has been hijacked uh, for most of us that it is it's trying to protect you and so it has to pay attention to what's threatening so we watch the news all the time because if at i literally saw this ad two days ago i was like i'm gonna write it the down. things that you're not doing that could that where you that where you to help you not die or something like that it was like at seven o'clock i'm like yeah everyone's gonna tune into that because people aren't gonna tune in to you know, hey, this many children are born and this many people got married and fell in love today. No one, no one's gonna, no one turns into that because it's not threatening. But the thing is, is here the the brain is primarily a deletion device because at any given time we could be paying attention to what hundreds of millions of stimuli, a billion stimuli, right? That we could be paying attention to. So primarily, our brain's trying to keep information out. Otherwise, we would go we would go insane. It would be way overwhelmed, right? And so what do we allow in that filter 
you know, the handful of things that we could pay attention to consciously are the things that are important to us, that could threaten us, that could be, that could uh, align with our values, that where our questions are, you know, activating that part of our brain, the reticular activating system. And, and we know it's important. We let that through. The challenge is it's kind of like an algorithm on social media that if you are going through Instagram and you like or comment, comment on every cat post, every cat post, every cat video, that algorithm is going to start showing you more cats. And all of a sudden you're going to see more cats show up and that's going to be your reality. You know, the challenge is that people are always tuning into the news or watching everything about the, what's threatening. I'm not, and again, I'm not saying don't gauge what's going on. I'm just saying the overindulgence could really disturb your peace of mind, your productivity, your performance, your positivity, all of that. I, I, I agree. That, that's all, all those things have been happening. By the way, I don't want you to feel like sometimes I'm, I'm typing. It's only because I'm taking notes on some of the things you're saying. I really love uh, some of these things. So I've been, I've been just jotting them down yes. in my, so, so our, our brain is like an algorithm, just like uh, a social media, Facebook algorithm. It starts feeding you the things you engage with. And if you start to watch the news and you hit this, this point where it just starts showing you darkness everywhere, because it's just like showing you cats on social media. And the challenge is, is that's what you've chosen out of the billion stimuli to focus on. And it puts you in this chronic stress or anxiety. And that's not good for your brain. If we're, if we're talking about being brain healthy, you know, chronic stress and anxiety shrinks your brain. We know right. chronic the fear, it, it, it actually suppresses your immune system. I mean, that, that's an area of science called psychoneuro immunology, psychoneuroimmunology, where if you're always afraid, then it, it compromises your immune system. So you're more susceptible to colds and flus, you know, and viruses. And so that, that so the goal, goal here is never not to be perfect. It's just to, to make progress and not to just lead a life where things are just happening or reacting to it. So if you're just watching the, what's dark, you're deleting everything else. Right. And so you're, that means you're not seeing the possibilities. You're not seeing the opportunities. You're not focusing on what you could be grateful for, you know, in that moment. And I'm just saying like, you know, gauge what's going on just like a thermostat does, but then also, you know, be proactive about, and you could always decide what things you want to focus on. You could always decide what things mean. Just like when you said, you know, like when you feel terror, it makes you move forward because that terror means you're about to grow. Or there's something that's going to be better on the other side of that. You're going to learn something, you know, you, but you chose going back to the power of choice that life is a C between the B and the D. You're, you're making a conscious choice about that. And I'm not saying it's easy. Nothing I'm saying is easy, I'm, but it's pretty simple, but it, it, it's, it's very hard too. So it could be that simple, but also it could be that hard and that difficult. But I'm just saying the overindulgence of media makes you just see everything that potentially is dark. And then you were doing that at nighttime. And then people wonder why they can't sleep at night, because those are the things that they they're putting into their their brain. And so my, my challenge for everybody who's listening is just to remind them that that they have more control than they think that we're not robots, that we do run on scripts, some habits, experts suggest 40% of our 40% of our our behaviors are purely unconscious habits, um, and whatever that number is, it, it is pretty substantial. Where we're not conscious, we're not putting mindfulness. What, what do you, what, what's an example of an unconscious habit? Because on the one hand, I think of like physical things. You know, mm -hmm. we're reminded, you know, don't touch your face. The average yeah. person touches their face mm -hmm. every minute, so that's one unconscious habit. But another unconscious habit could be, you know, oh, whenever I'm about to read a book, I end up passing the television and turning on the TV instead. Yeah. So, so that's so a little bit more where I have a little bit more choice. I feel there are, there are habits of behavior, certainly, um, that we, that we run scripts on and we get, we were, we're triggered by all, all the habit. And we, we have a whole chapter on, on designing and breaking habits, but everything starts with a reminder or a trigger, right? And so it can be an external trigger, something that you see and then you just do it, it could be also some people are, are hooked up for like they see a treadmill and they just feel that's their trigger and they just that's need my to trigger to run as far as possible <laughs> or some people like you know think about or or it's an internal trigger there's a feeling in their body maybe they get anxiety or fear and then they their their trigger or habit of behavior is they grab food 
right? Uh, so many people opening up the refrigerator so much now because of, of, of the stress, because it helps them to, to get in a different place. And I'm just saying there are, that we have choice in this. There are also habits besides behavior, there are habits of thought. You know, they say we have what, 50, 70,000 thoughts a day. And, you know, Deepak Chopra suggests that 90 or 95% of those thoughts are the same thoughts we had yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. And if we have the same habitual thoughts, we're going to have the same habitual focus. We also have habitual, not only behaviors and thoughts, we have habitual um, feelings. That, you know, we all have a go-to place when we're stressed. Some people feel uh, when they're triggered, they go anger. Some people feel guilt. Some people, you know, feel a sense of, of, of challenge and playfulness. But these are things that are ingrained through neuroplasticity. So the so the 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 good news and the bad news is these things are learned. But because they are learned, they could also be unlearned. And then we know through neuroplasticity uh, that having a thought or doing a new behavior to create new connections, much like uh, they they say that neurons that fire together, they wire together, and we create like maybe somebody walking through a field. It doesn't leave much of a mark, but if they keep on walking through that same field, that same path, it becomes very, very clear and ingrained. And we are like that with our with what we eat sometimes, what, what we think, what we feel, what we do. And this is relatively new research that you can kind of rewire your brain as an adult. So it used to be that uh, scientists thought that extreme learning or fast learning or changing behaviors was, was easiest to do as a kid. Turns out this is not as true as people thought that neuroplasticity happens your your entire life. You can rewire the brain, you can learn mm -hmm. new behaviors. So tell me specifically, like I wanna yeah. unlock myself yeah. from this hijacking of my brain that looks at the news <laughs> and the negativity that's out there. And I, I actually feel it too, just as a as a podcaster and also I have a, a, a you know, let's say an audience on Twitter or whatever, I feel like I've kind of rationalized myself into thinking, oh, well, the more I really study all of this data and these models, I'll be able to kind of help people interpret them. And to some extent that's true, but I feel like I've gotten a little obsessive. It's like my interest now is coronavirus. And I don't really like that. I don't think in the long run, this is that helpful to me. Exactly. And then I think that's part of unlimiting ourselves. You know, unlimiting is this process of removing limits and, uh, and just evaluating, being conscious of, is this serving me? So what can I right do? Now? Yeah. So, so I would say, first of all, be conscious of it. Right. And so it, it's hard, but it's difficult to turn off the news. It's difficult to turn, you know, to turn off your, your phone an hour before you go to bed because you are going against the grain for sure. And so again, it's not necessarily easy, but it is pretty simple, like what we need to be able to do, but it's, but it could be very difficult, but as it is for people getting on stage or doing stand up and practicing in a subway car or doing anything else like that, through that challenge, we get real change. And it's usually the difference that makes a difference. Even when you and I have talked about like in previous episode, like my morning routine, a lot of things I do, the 10 things every morning to jumpstart my brain, so some of those things, half those things are, are a little bit difficult because I want to get in the habit of doing difficult things. So when I need to be able to call on that grit, it shows up. I need to have that difficult conversation with a, with a client or a, a team member, or I need to get on stage where I'd normally be nervous. I've, I've built that a little bit of resilience. I love to recommend my favorite podcasts and I have with me on the show, one of my all-time favorite podcasters, Jordan Harbinger. Jordan, I love the Jordan Harbinger show and thanks for coming on for a minute or two to talk about it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Man, I really like that episode you did with Tony Hawk recently where he talks about the importance of taking risks. And of course, by the way, Tony Hawk is 11-time world champion skateboarder and is also probably made over a hundred million on making, you know, computer games about skateboarding and equipment and clothes and the whole thing. So what did he say about taking risks? Well, he's brilliant because he takes risks, but also it's not some sort of super calculated, all right, skateboarding is going to become this thing again. It had its moment in the eighties. And then when that went away, he just kept doing it and kept getting better at it because he really enjoyed doing it. And so that in itself was a risk, 
but it was kind of a risk to do something he loved. So he didn't see it at the time as a risk. And he came on the show and discussed a lot of this and his financial success, you know, involves an element of luck, but also involves him just sticking with something that he really enjoyed, figuring he would win just by sticking with something he enjoyed, even if it didn't make him rich. And funnily enough, very apropos today's news, one of the things that made him really angry, and he talked about this story on the show, was that he had an agent one time, a product manager or something like that. And he walked into the guy's office and there was a roll of toilet paper with his face on it. And he said, what the hell is that? And the guy sort of awkwardly joked that Tony Hawk was so successful and so hot right now that they could put his face on toilet paper and it would sell. And he fired the person like right on the spot. That is so funny. Well, and I also really love the fact that passion sometimes is more important than uh, immediate money. Meaning you can't, you always have to take, have for, you know, pay for your responsibilities and so on and, and make money some way. But when skateboarding had a slowdown, I guess this was in the early nineties for the X games, he just stuck with it. He, he worked in skateboard shops. He worked in, you know, the clothing area of skateboarding and, and in the whole subculture, he was still involved. He never left it. And a lot of people left it during this downturn. And that's what propelled him to such success later on. So great episode, Jordan. And I highly recommend not only the episode, but your entire podcast. Thanks for joining me here. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. So now that you're locked in, you know, due to this quarantining and social distancing and everything, what are, what are difficult things you've done during this crisis? Like, you know, again, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing what you're saying is, you know, kind of remind you're being aware. Don't look at the news as much. Disconnect your phone. You know, yeah, and that, those are all obvious. And then, and, and here's the thing: it's it's often those obvious things that and that are common sense that are not common practice. You know, the reason I wrote this book. This book initially was all methodology, things you and I have talked about in past episodes. Right. How to read three times faster. How to remember names and languages, facts, figures, everything. But then but I. By asked the way, myself, by the way, that's one of the few podcast. Our two podcasts together. I often have a hard time remembering, you know, many details from podcasts I did years ago, but I still, to this day, do the speed reading techniques, not to, not to skim. I read everything, but your techniques help in terms of learning and understanding and the memory techniques. I mean, right from our earliest episode, we talked about the memory palace and I still use uh, aspects of that when I, when I memorize things. They're, they're extremely, uh, I mean, it's, it's based on, on neuroscience and it's also based on 28 years of just field testing this with children with learning challenges to seniors and so on. I lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's. So, so keeping my brain healthy is just, just a paramount, you know, and by the way, those incidences where I had my brain injury as a child, I lost my grandmother to Alzheimer's at the same, you know, around the same age, they imprint you and they put you on a path because these life conditions spark change, right? They, they move you in a direction, just like right now. I mean, a great question to ask ourselves, I was talking about the power of questions about what to focus on is, um, you know, when you're having these habitual 50, 60,000 thoughts a day or whatever, are a lot of those thoughts are the questions we're asking ourselves. And there are certain questions we ask more than others. But if we're always asking these questions about what we fear, we're just kind of seeing that's, that's the lens we focus on. Uh. And so going back to this, it's the struggle part. Like, what am I doing that could be difficult? Understanding that difficulty, and you're a great example of this, leads to, to growth, meaning adversity could lead to an advantage, a struggle could lead to strength. It, it's really, it's kind of like, let's extend this metaphor a little bit about a butterfly and a caterpillar. Let's say a boy is in the backyard and playing, comes across a caterpillar and runs inside, talks to the mom and, and just, can I keep this? Can I please keep this as a pet, this caterpillar? Can I keep it? And the mom says, fine, as long as you feed it every day and you care for it, you take care of it. And she gives him a mason jar. And then he runs he runs outside, puts the caterpillar in the mason jar, fills it with leaves so he, the caterpillar could eat, puts a couple of tree branches in there, decorates it nice, and um, and just watches. And just watches this caterpillar in awe as all the caterpillars really do is just eat. And over time, one day, the caterpillar, who's gotten a little plump, starts to climb up the, the tree branch, the little branch that's in the jar, and starts spinning a cocoon around itself. And the boy's in utter amazement, total fascination, right? This bewilderment, never, never seen this before. 
And the cocoon, he's just waiting and waiting and waiting and watches it for, for time and days. And, and then one day, though, to surprise, there's a little opening coming from, you know, within. And the caterpillar makes this little, little crack and, it, and it's trying to get out. But it's having a hard time, if, if you've ever seen this on video. It's, it's struggling. And the boy's a little impatient and also to, wants to help its pet. Um, so he runs inside the house, grabs a pair of scissors and clips the opening you know that little hole open and all of a sudden the butterfly flops out but unexpected to the boy what he was expecting it doesn't look like a butterfly fully kind of does but it's like mutated it says the body is very swollen and the and the wings are very shriveled and he's just waiting for that butterfly to you know transform in front of his eyes and fly like he's seen by the butterflies and it, and, it, and it doesn't and he goes into the house and, you know, starts crying and say, what's wrong with my butterfly to his mom? And he asked, she asked what he did. And she, she explains that he cut open the hole. And she explains to him that it's through the struggle, you know, going through that struggle of trying to get through the cocoon. Actually, it's the whole physiologically when the butter, when the caterpillar is coming out, out through that hole, it actually pushes the fluid from the body into the wings so it nourishes the wings so they could they could grow and grow strong. And it's through the struggle that the butterfly gets its strength to be able to fly. It's just a bad story, um, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, this is not a... But some of us feel like, again, we're in this cocoon and, and, and we're struggling right now. But again, just like you going on stage or putting yourself in terror, you know, situations where you know intellectually you're safe, physically safe. You know, you do it because that's where you build your skills. That's where you grow the most. Because while the while the comfort zone is nice, not much grows there, right? And so it's the struggle. And so, mm. you know, even in life, when we just do the easy things in life, which is really right now sitting and binge watching uh, Netflix or Hulu, Disney Plus, whatever people are binge watching every single show ever made, you know, and the easy thing to do is just eat junk food and just sit on the couch and do that. You know, it's not, it's not, we don't, we don't grow. We are not growing from that. Cause if we just do the easy things, then life gets hard over time. But if we do the hard things, life gets a lot easier. So, so like what are, yeah. what are now, if, if I was going to put together a framework for how I should act during this lockdown, we don't yeah. know how long the lockdown is going to last. Like, I think the economy might reopen, but there still might be heavy social distancing, quarantining, mm -hmm mini lockdowns, personal yeah. lockdowns, you know, self-isolating. So while I'm home for this extended period, yeah. what are like the five things I can do to, to really up my game, uh, uh, enhance my brain, you mm -hmm. know, really it's be a, more, uh, achieve my potential. So, absolutely. So the, the, the master question I want everyone to ask is just begin as we begin with the end in mind is we are going to come out of this eventually. Nobody knows how long it's going to be, right? But what's the story you want to tell about this time? Mm. And we are writing that story every single moment with every single decision and choice that we're making right now. So if you fast forward to six months from now, a year from now, how are you going to tell people what this time was like? And we could come out of this, you know, the choices we make now can make us, when we emerge from this, you know, better or smarter or stronger in certain ways. And so the, the five things that I would focus on in terms of choice in no particular order is I would use, I'll, I'll make it five C's, right? Because I just have, I have to alliterate everything. So you have the three clarity. M's in the book, you have the exactly. four D's, uh, now we've got yes. five C's. Here we go. Five C's you could do while you're cocooning. Uh, number one, I would say clarity. This is a wonderful time to reset and reevaluate. I think self-awareness is a superpower. I think that's part of the reason why we're here as the human experience is, is discovering more about ourselves. And this is a nice time to in solitude for self-reflection. And some people just don't like that solitude, but I feel like that it's so important that in order to get your 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 mind right, you not we don't have a lot of maybe distractions if you turn off the television. And in the space of solitude, we could discover some kind of clarity. Simple prompt for that is just asking yourself, just checking in with yourself, as some people do on New Year's or their birthday, is like, what's most important to me in my life, you know, or my relationship right now, as without going to the past, like if I was to start zero-based thinking, what what's most important to me in my career? What's most important to me as 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 in my family? But but Jim, let me let me ask. Like, let's say um, 
I, let's say I'm worried about my job or let's say yeah. I'm worried about my family's health or whatever. And I'm just, my brain's kind of been fixated. Like you said, mentioned earlier, it's been hijacked. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it might be difficult for me to kind of switch channels on the brain. Like how do I, how do I do that? Yeah. And, and I would start that you need a reason. First of all, you need a reason to do anything. Like one of the keys to motivation, and we'll go through this obviously in, 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 the, in the limitless episode, is not motivation being hyped up in the moment and excited and jumping on chairs and the next day nothing happens, but getting clear on the reason because we know that reasons, they reap results. That if you don't, you know, if you need to start with why, that part of the success formula is three H's, head, heart, hands, that you could want to make a change here, but it's hard right, to make it out here with your hands. You get done pointing to my head. You have an idea in your head that you want to make a change, but you're not acting with your hands because you're in fright. And get checking in with the second H, which is our heart, is allowing yourself to feel the pleasure or the pain that will come, the consequences of doing this thing or not doing this thing. Meaning that if you, you know, what a wonderful time right now to clarify your life, but having a reason to do that, if you don't have a reason to clarify your life, we won't do it. If you don't have a reason to get on that stage, you're not going to do it. If you don't have a reason to to work out, you're not going to do it on a regular basis. So, it's always going to be forced. So, and I I like this because it reminds me of um, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. This guy was in Auschwitz in a concentration camp, but managed to survive not only physically but emotionally because he asked himself these same questions: uh, you know, what was his, what was the meaning of his life? And he had different meanings throughout, but that it was asking that question. So, so to get clarity, it's kind of like, let's say I'm, I'm scared. I can say, Hey, what just reevaluating, what's my goal in life? What's my meaning? What's my purpose? And I might not have an answer, but just having, you know, setting aside some time instead of watching TV for three hours, maybe just watch TV for two and a half hours and spend a half hour writing possibilities down. What, yeah. where can and, I go? And part of this, and part of this is just drowning out. It's some, similar to eating, um, you know, the, the negativity that we put in our mind. And I feel like we have to stand guard to that similar to how we stand guard to the people in our life that can be negative or draining on you. Similar that, that we stand guard to the food we eat. Like, you know, we have choice about what we're putting into our mouth at, at all times, but sometimes it's habitual and it takes energy and effort and, and reasons to be able to change that behavior. But I know nothing will happen unless somebody has, has a reason to, to be able to do that. So I would say, I, I always would break it down in the smallest, simplest steps where you can't fail. It's like that negativity, like if you just ate good food and just eventually you wouldn't, you wouldn't crave as much the f junk food. Right. It, it, because you're just giving yourself what it needs. Same thing when you're around positive people that are encouraging and challenging you and supporting you, you have less tolerance for the people who aren't that. And same thing with the news, like one of the, the ways you balance it out is, you know, is what you're reading, what you're listening to feed your mind instead of, you know, watching the news every single night and through your social media feed, listening to a podcast, you know, where you get inspiration, you get some instruction, you get some hope, you get some help. But part of it is drowning out the negativity and doing small, simple things. The, the way you control your focus is by controlling the questions that we ask. And some people have, you know, certain dominant questions like, you know, why is this happening to me? And then all of a sudden your brain is a meaning searching, you know, device. It's going to start seeing, oh, it, this is why it's happening to me. And this is why it's happening to me. And this is everything. And then that's all you see as opposed to what you could be focusing on. And it is, is a little is it a little Pollyanna? It's it's more more like how your brain deletes. And so decide what you want to delete. And because we automatically were distorting things, we're generalizing things, but why not doing it in our favor where we're more resourceful? So the first C I would say is is clarity. And again, in no particular order, use this time for a little bit of self-reflection. You know, you could journal and just re revisit, you know, where you are. Cause when, on, when do we have this pause? Cause often we just, we go to the job, go to the job, we're doing whatever we're doing, right? Where we're with the same people, we're eating the same food. Random, we don't get that reset, this hard reset right now to reevaluate and just like, Hey, is this really what I'm about? And it's a nice place in your little space to just find out what your values are or reconnect with what's most important to you in a relationship in your career and your fulfillment and everything else. And then are your actions aligned with those values? So that would be like clarity. Another C, and this is obvious again, the five are going to be obvious. That's okay. Nothing, nothing's obvious in, in, in these times because 
there's so many bad habits we've been slipping into because of this strain on our bodies. And I think a, a coach also just reminds you of what you already know, you know, because common sense is not often common practice. And we need to hear certain things to balance out all the other stuff that, you know, our brain has been hijacked about. So clarity. Uh, another C uh, is care. And that's obvious, right? But we've talked about this. It's not just your physical hygiene, sanitizing everything and wash your hands for 20 seconds and, and you know, six feet or, you know, all this, but it's also mental hygiene and the things that you can do to care for yourself. Because again, if you're, if you're, if you're concerned, see, see my, my thing is where you're going to put your power and your attention. Like we can't control everything that's going on with the spread of this pandemic. You know, so we can't control that from an external standpoint. Um, we could control how we could, but we can't, we can't control even how the government, you know, and their health care, but we can control as much as we can our own personal health care. We can't control the economy necessarily, but we can control our own personal finances and, and economy. And com coming back to that, what can you do to just take care of your immune system, the self-care? How are you, you know, what are you choosing to eat every single day as part of self-care? Part of self-care is also supplementing in vitamin C, which is good for your immune system. Part of self-care is prioritizing your sleep because I, I know this is going to have a big, I mean, talk about mental health, all the anxiety and then the level of sleeplessness right now, but it, it's hard. It's hard to go to bed, sure. you know, at, at the same time and not just watch the news until two o'clock in the morning. Um, and so, but prioritizing it because it's coming back to motivation is just like not only the pleasure you'll get out of having a better life, meaning more productivity, performance, peace of mind, prosperity, you know, that that's obvious, right? If you want your business to grow, you need, you need to be able to grow and take care of yourself. But it's also the, the, the allow yourself to feel the pain. Like if you don't do this, what's the consequence then? You know, it, like I, I, I have a, a for acquaintance that I know had a heart attack and still didn't change their diet, diet or lifestyle, you know, but when the daughter came to him and said, you know, like and cried to him and basically, and he wanted, he made the change in his lifestyle because he wanted to walk his daughter down the aisle. So let me, let me ask you with, with care, what's, um, what's a mental, uh, hygiene thing someone can do. Yeah. So, so we talked in the book, 10 things you could do for, for self-care specifically for your brain, you know, and it has everything to do with the brain foods and optimizing sleep. But one of them is, is stress management. We talked about how chronic stress, anxiety, fear shrinks your brain and how it compromises your immune system, makes you more susceptible to that. So it have some kind of practice and people go to meditation or they go to whatever they go, whatever helps them to get in that parasympathetic state, that rest, that digest, that recovery, you know, even taking, you know, 20 minutes off and just like having white space and going for a walk and being creative, whatever, whatever. I think a lot of people when it comes to care, they're not burnt out because they say this all the time that they're burnt out because they're so busy, right? And everyone's addicted for this. It's a badge of honor for being busy, right? Because it means you're significant. And what I'm saying is that maybe you're not burnt out because you're doing too much. Maybe you're burnt out because you're doing too little of the things that 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 nourish you, that light you that's, up. That's a great you point. Know, help you to shine, shine. And so care is not just about the food you eat and prioritizing sleep. Care is also falling in love with that person in the mirror that's you know been through so much, but is still standing and acknowledging that and self compassion and you know knowing part of self care also is drawing knowing that when you say reminding yourself when you say yes to everybody or everything that you're you know make sure you're not saying no to yourself that having borders around your time and your energy or emotion is 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 part of self-care and self-love also and so so uh i sort of feel that um you know all, a lot of these oh, oh here's the question i was gonna ask is is self-care being escapist at all like in in the sense that uh, when I watch TV for three hours and I'm taking a break from that news and I'm escaping into that, or let's say I play chess online for hours, yeah. is that rejuvenating or is that kind of just sinking me into more into my morass of, of thoughts and fears and so on? I'm just escaping them. I'm not actually rejuvenating. Yeah. I think it's individual as a coach. My goal is to help people to reach their goal and in, in, in the most efficient, effective, enjoyable way. And so if, I have no problem with people binge watching that or playing games and video games and doing that. If that are intention, if their intention behind it is entertainment, I, I see that I see complete value out of that. It's just whatever your outcome is. It's just, you can't complain about 
my, my, my thing is excuses and com people complaining about, um, you can't be upset by the results you didn't get, by the work you didn't do. So my thing is that, like that. play video games or, or binge watch, if, that, if that's your thing and you want to rejuvenate and you want to distract yourself, use it with intention. But I'm saying, you know, we, not everybody, if we're real here, not everybody has the same network connections, not everybody has the same income, not everybody has the same education, but we all have 24 hours in a day. So it's just how you choose to invest it. And I, who am I to say, don't play video games? If it gives you joy and it helps you to relax and it gives you a, a sense of, you know, staves off some of the, the other stuff that, that that's, I'd rather you do that than some other things, activities, because there's far worse things that you do. And know that if you're also, your goal is to have, you know, this and build this brand and, and, and have this kind of income lifestyle that there's, a, there's an opportunity cost and just own it. That's all I ask people to do is just own your stuff, right? And so do it if you people if you want to, but then also don't be upset if we're not getting results from work we're not doing. I'm talking about clarity on your life, what's important to you, caring for yourself. And I'm not saying spend 24 seven self-care because that, that could be selfish because there are other things. These are just one thing you can do. It's just reminding yourself, take care of yourself because some people tend to, you know, be there for everybody else, put themselves last, mm. you know, and these little choices add up. It's the consistency of all this because little by little, a little adds up to a lot because right? consistency compounds. So I'm just saying you don't have to do all of this. Just, just one little thing puts you in a different direction consistently, right? And you can make it just like, Dr. B.J. Fox from Stanford talks about small little steps, you know, read, you don't have to read 45 minutes a day, read one line a day, you know, but I, I don't that. think a lot of people are going to stop there. I think a lot of people go within the next sentence, next sentence. So you have clarity, you have caring. I would also say another C is contribution, because I feel like that's part of why we're here is not just to receive, but also to contribute. And people might say, well, I don't have a lot to contribute doesn't have to be just your money, you know, that could be part of your treasure, but it's also your talent. It's also your time. Like all these amazing people who are flying here to New York and they're on the front lines of this, you know, using their expertise to, to make things better, but it could, doesn't have to be anything vast. It could be just checking in on your neighbor that lives down the hallway, right? Or, or an elderly, but contribute. It's hard to feel fear and feel a sense of service and giving at the same time. Mm. You know, even when I had to get over my, fear of speaking because, you know, I had the broken brain. I would, I would get so upset if I had to get a book report, like I would go sick in my stomach. And, you know, I was so scared of getting the spotlight because my superpower growing up as a kid was shrinking, was being invisible because when you don't feel like you have a lot to offer, but for me to get over that now and being in front of audiences, even having this conversation, knowing how people all around the world is watching it as I think about service. I think about the one person who's listening to this that needs to hear something in this conversation. And that that gets me over my fear. I can't I can't feel fear and gratitude or giving at the same time. You know, so that, how can you that's such a great point. I actually even write about that in in uh my book, uh Choose Yourself, is that mm -hmm. is that when you get into that state where you're helping somebody, and I've been I've been trying to do that during this period, like we went to you know, there's odd volunteer jobs right now. For instance, you can go to a shelter or a food line and it's not, you don't have to necessarily uh, help with serving the food. You know what they need help with? They need help keeping everybody six feet apart on the line yeah. because homeless shelters are getting shut down um, yeah. for not keeping six feet, people, people six feet apart. So there's all these odd volunteer jobs. The other thing about giving and money is that you don't have to give a lot. So there's a lot of GoFundMes for employees, for instance, who have been laid off by restaurants and bars and maybe the restaurants and bars that you frequent a lot in your neighborhood. And I've been just going to those GoFundMes and if you give $10, it's not gonna yeah. break the bank, but you'll feel like you did something for, for these people who you've, who are part of your life. And, and, and I, I think that, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm a small business owner in, in the city, you know, I own a, uh, a bar slash comedy club. So I hear a lot about the employees um, in the different restaurants in town. And I, I always contribute to the GoFundMes no matter what. I think, again, little by little, little becomes a lot. And yes. if any way you could give for you particularly, it's individual for each person, but it helps us also to, to mitigate that fear. And when we're feeling a sense of certainty that we can make a difference. And I feel like everything in nature you know, it, it gives back to the environment. And so, you know, my, my formula has always been learn, earn, return, 
right? The more you can learn, the more you can earn, the more you can return and be able to give. And so for us- I love these quotes, these letter, these acronyms, and these, what do you call it? A lot lot of Twitter, Twitter, uh, quickisms. (laughs) Uh, Um, There's there's a phrase for it when the the back half of the word is the same sound on every word. I forgot what that is. Uh, So these devices, whether they're acronyms or these little mnemonic things that rhyme or whatever, it's just these little like, you know, things, these little brain bites that that stick with people. But but I don't don't want to dilute the power behind it also. Like I make it memorable for people so they could repost it and they're, you know, like people post it like, oh, I love this. And they'll tag both of us after this conversation. I challenge people to do that. But going back to contribution is contribute in your own way. There's no one's writing this like you choose. Like for us on Facebook and Instagram, we are doing lives for kids and because all the schools are shut down globally. And so I'm teaching them the one thing they didn't learn in school, which is learning how to learn. And I'm just going on every couple of weeks and just doing office hours and I'm doing big group people tuning in on Instagram live, Facebook live. And I'm just teaching them how to focus, how to study, how to how to read faster, how to do those things. We're doing one, you know, coming up for recession proofing your brain, absolutely free, with no with no agenda. It's just our unique way of contributing. You know, I, I even created, you know, during this time, a ten day program, uh, basics of speed reading, memory, reverse negative self talk, to give to everybody who pre orders the book because it just it'll help them to read the book you know, and it'll just empower people. So how can you contribute in a meaningful way for you? So that's the third C. So we have clarity, we have care, we have contribution. And then the two that you already mentioned, I I would say that, you know, that sometimes that we hear something enough, you know, then eventually it sticks. But this is also a time, you know, that we could use as productive time, you know, we could use this to create. And I don't know if this is true or not, but you see these memes online that, that during the plague, Shakespeare was, you know, physically distancing himself. And I say physical distancing because it's just like you and I are being social right now. So it's not like, we're, you know, you could be social through FaceTime and Zoom and phone calls and stuff like that. But we are physically distancing ourselves for, for the reasons that of what's going on in the world. But he was um, Shakespeare was physically distancing himself. And during that time, you know, he had this surge, this personal renaissance where he was able to what was it, King Lear, Macbeth, Anthony, Cleopatra, you know, he was very creative. And so, you know, using this time and who knows what it's, how long it's going to be, but how, how great would it be to go back and revisit that, that script you were writing or that, that video or, or that art or however you personally express yourself again. It's, it's, it's such a great point because again, I feel we've been kind of locked into this hourly news cycle. And again, for me, I've sort of rationalized it by saying, okay, Mm-hmm. I have a background in, you know, data, science, statistics, computer science. And I also, because of this podcast, I've talked to leaders in almost every industry. Mm-hmm. So I have a good skill set of interpreting data and kind of communicating it. And again, I have that skill set from the writing and podcasting and so on and communicating it in such a way that it's understandable. It's not um, hysterical uh, like a lot of the news is because I'm not trying to capture I, so, so I'm rationalizing it by saying I'm providing a contribution, but there's also, you know, I don't think I've done enough of the, the self-care part while I've been, uh, you know, thinking so much about this. Exactly. And, and, and that could be your thing though. Like, so like, it's not even like judging and you could do, as long as you know that you have intention and so you don't have any kind of regret and you're doing it with purpose. So I have no problem with people who are looking at everything, trying to get all the facts together. So they're using it more than just as a way just to indulge you know what i mean in cycle down, yeah. like in, in places and so if you're, you're able to use that and be able to use it to make help make decisions you have a huge platform and if you're utilizing that that wisdom the accumulated knowledge and distinctions that that, that that's wonderful and again I, I i'm not the judge like people who could do whatever they want with their whatever is most important to them for clarity whatever they're going to do for care whatever they're creative however they're going to uniquely contribute i'm just saying we have these time. Most people say they don't have time. Well, most people now have a little bit more time. And so they could, this could be the most productive period of your life. Maybe someone during this time comes up with something that really does put a dent in the universe. I feel like saying that though. And I feel like a lot of people are saying, oh, you should be productive. It almost feels like a little bit of a homework assignment, even though I agree with it. So when I'm Mm -hmm. creative during this period, it makes me feel so much better than when I'm not being creative. But it's one of those things where uh, again, I, it, it's like you were saying earlier, you got to start off small. So 
There's mm-hmm. a lot of things. And, and, and you mentioned James Clear has been on your podcast. He just sent around a, a great note, which even with five minutes of your time, if, if, if you just write for five straight minutes, you'll write a page. If yeah. you do push-ups for five straight minutes, that's a pretty good workout. So, you know, it doesn't need to be a lot of time at first. You know, even when you stop listening to this or even in the middle of listening to this, put this on pause for five minutes and just journal for those five minutes. Like, don't even pick the pen up, kind of Julia Cameron style, which she talks about in the artist way with her um, her journaling. But... Yeah. But okay, so create is is a good fourth one. And I think that that's then, a really powerful one. And then the fifth one I would offer, and I'm sure we could come up with more together, is uh, capability. And this is the skill development. You know, we've always said that, hey, when I have some time, I'm going to learn this language or I'm going to learn how to code or I'm, I'm going to learn how to be able to do whatever. And now we have unfettered access to all the information online through podcasts like yours, through books. And, great. and now there's a lot of great online uh, schools exactly. like Coursera or Teachable. Exactly. Or whatever. exactly. And so now is a wonderful time to be able to level up your learning. And again, I, 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 under, I feel what you're saying that, you know, we were hearing everyone saying, let's be productive. Let's, and then part of the reason you do that also is so you're not doing something else, right? So you're not doing the stuff that we know is, is in serving our greater good or anybody else. And so capabilities is, you know, you have your to-do list, but maybe you start a to-learn list and you revisit that. And what's what, and you know what the key to these five things are is just when you mention like it's time, right? Because time and attention is what life is made out of. And so what I would say is start small, right? I call it S3, small, simple steps and schedule it. And if you just do that, you know, start small with your self-care and just schedule when you're going to do that five minutes of, you know, calisthenics or, or, or rebounding, you know what I mean? Or a little bit of CrossFit, whatever. Start small and then just schedule it. Schedule, you know, your creative time. Hey, I'm going to read just for this these five minutes a day. That's it. Small, simple step. And then you do it. And the habit that you're building is the habit of showing up for yourself, you know, consistently over and over again, you know, schedule time for being creative. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. But just like you said, hey, I'm going to write for just five minutes. And it's so, so we don't have to make it daunting. And, and I know when we talk about the limitless model, that's a big part because it's about one of the myths and the lies and the mindset area besides 10% of your brain and intelligence is fixed, you know, or, you know, these kind of lies is that knowledge is power. And we've talked about this, that knowledge, that all the podcasts and books and courses, none of it works unless we work. And, and so, so I would say is, you know, make, make it a small, simple step and then schedule these things and little by little mm-hmm. again scheduling is 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 very important too yes because we don't we schedule doctors appointments or we schedule pta meetings we schedule meetings with investors or clients but we don't always schedule the things for our own personal care self development and and growth you know i um i a few years ago i wasn't living in new york city for a little while i was living about 60 miles north and one of the best things I ever did. So I'm a heavy reader and I'm not a heavy, uh, online learner. Like I don't do a lot of online courses, but I did this one course on Coursera. This was like, I think 2015 or 2016. And it was a a course called, uh, sapiens. It was the history of the human species. And it was uh, obviously Yuval Harari who ended up writing the book sapiens based on the course. He was the instructor and it was, I learned so much it was, it changed my life just taking that one course and seeing the history of the human species from a different perspective. And again, this was long before he came out with the the book sapiens. And, and then he was on my podcast a couple of times, but mm. it really changed my thinking about a lot of different things. And, you know, I, if you go to Coursera now or any of these online schools and just see what courses they offer, it doesn't take a lot to take one course. You don't have to do all the homework. You don't have to do all the assignments. You can just listen to the, the half hour or hour, you know, uh, classes each week. And it's just, um, just even something like that's really valuable to, but, but it was easier for me to schedule it living outside of New York than living in New York, New York. I feel you're, you're kind of immersed in the just flow of life here. And now it's the flow of anxiety, but, uh, you know, all of these things are important. So I'm going to just quickly summarize on this. So there's clarity, which is kind of just asking yourself or, or reminding yourself, Hey, this is a step back. Yes, I have all these things I'm worried about, but if 
just being curious about what what are my possibilities as as we get into this new normal when this uh you mm-hmm. know lockdown ends and this quarantining ends there's there's care which involves physical self care mental health care and they're and they're related and emotional health care as well they're all related so everything from hygiene to maybe some quiet time or journaling or whatever and then there's being um and then there's contribution which I think is very important. Uh, and there's, there's probably a million ways to contribute, but we talked about a couple. One is directly contributing to, uh, or another is contributing your, your time or another is checking in with, you know, a, a loved one or somebody who might be lonely or some, an elderly person or, and there's also, by the way, online, you can find volunteer opportunities where you check in via zoom on people who are elderly and just need to touch base with somebody. Or there's also, um, there's lots of, if you search for coronavirus volunteer opportunities, there are a lot of, uh, things that come up. Then you talked about being creative. So either again, journal, or maybe take out a crayon and just, just draw a little bit, or I don't know, what are some other ways someone could be, uh, creative, go to, go to Teespring and, and make a t-shirt and, and sell it or do something. What are some other creative things? Yeah, I mean, I think the future belongs a lot to the creative creators and creatives because absolutely, you know, where jobs you're going to machines and automation and artificial intelligence. I think what makes us innately human and valuable in society is, you know, I talk about limitless. The, what's what's unlimited? The unlimited resource we have on planet Earth is is the human mind. It's human potential. There's no limit to creativity. There's no limit to imagination. There's I no think people limit. think there is a limit, though. Yeah. I, and I think that would be a lie. And so like, and here's the thing, it's not about what's true or what's not true. It's what, it, it's what serves you. Like these decisions that we make, these, these things, ideas, whether they're a lie that were an idea that we're entertaining or something else, I feel like that, you know, it helps to have a global idea on something that gives me more possibilities and potential. Cause I think most people fall short of, of hitting things that they don't want to achieve. But, but, you know, it's interesting because there's a, like, I'm not going to be, and maybe this is a self-limiting belief, but I'm not going to be as good a painter as a Vincent van Gogh. So, so there might be ways in which skill is limited, but in terms of being creative, I can sit down and try to paint like Vincent van Gogh anyway, nothing can stop me from doing that. It's not like I'm going to make $40 million doing it, but I, I, I can, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. Yeah. And I, and I think that, that, that belief that that's more empowering than what the opposite, because what, what, what's the opposite that we have no potential to be able to do that. And, you know, when it comes to creativity, there are infinite possibilities, right. In terms of what you, how you express yourself and the people that even innovate, they're asking those different questions about, we could go into this in another conversation, but creativity is just how what how you want to be able to express yourself, and knowing that there's there's always a a third and a fourth, and then many different ways. Yeah, I think I think, right. You're you're right. Creativity is a, a subject entirely on its own, but it's interesting because there's there's something called, there's a cognitive bias called the Dunning Kruger effect, which is a nice way of or, or a scientific way of saying. Um, uh, you know, a little knowledge could be uh, a harmful thing. I forget what the actual expression is, but you know, what, it, what this bias is, is if you start to do something and you get excited about it, you usually think you're better than you are. So for instance, young drivers often think they're up nine out of 10 drivers think they're, they're above average, which is impossible. <laughs> but only four out of 10 are. And, right. uh, you know, but it's important to I think there's a, a useful side to Dunning Kruger bias, which is the first time you sit down to write a novel, you're probably not going to write the best novel on the planet. But if you th- if you think you're good, if you're excited about your your growth, that'll keep you going through that period of rejection and frustration and and self doubt and so on. So when I started doing stand up, I would say it took probably a couple of years before I could really handle myself in a professional room but I had Dunning Kruger bias. So I thought I was brilliant right in the beginning. And that kept me going through those first, let's say three years even where I, I wasn't really at the potential I wanted, but I didn't quite knew, know that. I only knew that on certain days, not on every day. And uh, uh, it kept me going. Yeah, no, I hear exactly what you're saying. For me, again, it's not right or wrong. It's, it's what's serving you. 
and you, and your intention and your your outcome. And so, what 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 is empowering you in that moment, and what what's not. And so, for me, I I choose to believe that that everybody could express themselves and be creative, and that there's a, there's always a way. Whether that's true or not, who knows? But I choose to believe it because I'll act accordingly, and hopefully, I'll err more on getting more results than if I had the opposite belief. Well, well, and it also helps like in, in, in the field of creativity and any field you're pursuing. So there's one hand where it's just putting your mind to creative use and mm-hmm. there's uh, lots of ways to do that. But in, in a specific field, if you're creative, you're, you're also trying to find your own unique voice. Uh, what, what, how can I, I don't want to draw like Vincent van Gogh. I want to draw like how I would draw if I had great skills as an artist. Mm-hmm. But now anybody can pick up a crayon and draw, so that's that's creative no matter what. But then we your, your fifth C was capability and learning a skill. And here's a gr- a great time to kind of combine. Uh, um, you're you're ultimately going to have confidence not by telling yourself to be confident, but by getting good at something. And then you're confident that hey, I'm better at this than yeah. most other people. And it's not that hard to be better than most people. It's just, it, people don't realize this. It just takes a little bit of work to be in the top 1% of almost any field. Now it doesn't mean you're in the top hundred people in the world, but the top 1%, like let's say you played, you know, golf probably. And I, and I don't play golf at all. So I'm, 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 I might not know what I'm talking about, but it probably to be in the top 1%, I don't need a handicap of 10 or 20 to be in the top 1% of all humans in the world at golf. And and so it doesn't take a lot to to experience that exponential learning curve and feel good about skills that you're learning and and where you are in in, in rank and so on. I, I agree. And I in psychology they have this competence confidence loop that the more competent you get at something, the more confident you have and, uh, confidence. And because you're confident, you're going to do that thing more, which should make you more competent. Which it's totally true. Your confidence, sure, and I and I whether it's stand up or it's golf or anything, you'll notice with these five C's. I always, as a, as a coach, like I, I don't treat everybody the same. I'm saying self care the way you self care. You know, get clarity on your own life, your own values. Contribute in your own unique way. Use your talents to be able to do something in your situation. Create however you create, not how anybody else does. And capabilities learn is something. So I I I keep it open ended, it's structured. All you know, all I ask is, hey, you know, if you're having trouble getting some traction with this, break it down into something small and not intimidating that requires a little effort and energy where you can't fail and you could show up, or at least, you know, get over this fear of, you know, I'll do, I'll do the stand up. I'll say that publicly right now with you. I'll, I'll, I always tell people to try something at least three times. You know, try it once to try to, you know, mitigate the fear of it. Try it again to just, you know, kind of get the groove and maybe learn it a little bit, try it again the third time to see if you like it or not. Because maybe, you know, part of finding your passion is creating it and just giving yourself stimulus and novelty and see where your, you know, your heart goes. And uh, because you don't want, you could, you could, I think people could do a lot of things, but they can't do everything. And so even whether it's it's a great point though, people can do a lot of things. You don't have to pick a lane and only stick to that lane. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's funny because, uh, Three and a half weeks ago, I was in the Netherlands and I was actually performing and touring all over the Netherlands, hit five different cities in seven wow. days and did stand up. Maybe the last international touring comedian in history, depending on these travel bans. Cause the day after I came back, uh, there were all the lockdowns and travel bans started. Mm-hmm. And so I actually haven't done any stand up now in almost a month where, and the last one I did was in Rotterdam and you know, it was very exciting, huge crowd, everything. And it's been a, a weird shift, but I've been dusting off. A lot of people have been asking me during this period, oh, what investment opportunities are out there? Because I have a background in that as well. And I've written a bunch of books on that. So I've been dusting off that skill set while relaxing a little bit, the stand-up skill set, even though I'm, I'm missing it now. Yeah. And with technology today, just even when we're saying you know, you could contribute or create or anything is like, we're having this conversation using technology, you know, stand up clubs don't have to be limited to four walls, neither do classrooms. And, and so we could, you need, you could, you, I would love, I would, I would tune into an Instagram live or you do stand up. That'd be amazing. And yeah, so I, maybe I'll try that. I don't, I don't know. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. 
I got, my, you know what the thing is now though is you i have to everybody every comedian has to write new material i feel because the only topic at the moment is coronavirus yeah so yeah. But we'll, and and it's it's an interesting time and so the, again difficult times they i mentioned this but difficult times as a reminder they could define us difficult times they could diminish us or they could difficult times could develop us and it comes back to we decide we have this choice that that again while the butter the beauty is in the butterfly the the, the growth is having the cocoon and sometimes you have to fight through some bad days to to earn your your better days right like when the caterpillar thinks like the world is over then it be it emerges and it becomes a butterfly and when we're talking about a butterfly we could also have this butterfly effect just like how everything has spread with the pandemic in a negative way so has fear right there's this whole mind virus which i'm you know is is extremely damaging also as well but that butterfly you know spreading its wings and and you know, uh, flapping its wings here in New York could create a tsunami of change across the globe, metaphorically, because you know, it's clump complex systems. And we could flap our wings with, you know, as 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 much as a virus changes things, uh, as uh, as fear spreads, so does so does kindness. I, I really do believe so does kindness, so does caring, so does compassion, so does love, and all that stuff is free. So we should be sprinkling that stuff everywhere because we we never know the ripple effect and who needs to hear it. Like even. Like, did you hear like how people were cheering last night at seven o'clock? Yeah, um, for all the health care workers and and uh, people on the front lines. I mean, like that that stuff. It's um, you know, it's it, it spreads, and so I'm saying is that you know, it, it things are the way they are, and we can't change the past. What we have, are we can always control though, is what we focus on. What things mean, we can control our self talk. We can control what we put in our body. You know, whether it's the food or what we're feeding it, whether it's podcasts, you know, we could control, you know, who we're socializing with right now and we control our con contribution. It's just, you don't have to do everything, but do, but do, but do something, you know, you know so what you just said, uh, uh, we use the word, you know, uh, kindness and, and, and you also said fear can be contagious. And it's very interesting because I guess like when you think about this virus, let's say you have the virus you're invisibly shedding cells of the virus all the time. And that's how people, that's how you're contagious. That's how people around you get it. But I guess as humans, we're constantly shedding whatever it is that's in our minds and or on our bodies. Like, so, so you see this on, on Twitter or in the media very acutely, where if somebody's afraid and they start posting all these tweets, like 6 million unemployed, we're up to a million infections. It, that's contagious. People then get afraid. Your fear becomes contagious. Whereas kindness also, there's a lot of evidence, like, like take these GoFundMes uh, mm -hmm. for charity. There's evidence that if you share, you know, I don't like to share on my page when I donate, cause it feels like, oh, bragging, whatever. But there's all these studies and they GoFundMe sends you a message after you donate. People are three times more likely to make a contribution if they see one of their friends uh, has contributed. So that's why people are encouraged to actually share. So, cause it is like you say, kindness is contagious. It's almost a, a sixth C make sure whatever you do, you're, you're, you're not afraid that it's going to be contagious. I'm saying what we do matters and, and people are watching and you know, who's, who's counting us on us to come out of this you know, better so we could be able to better serve them, whether it's our customers, whether it's our families, whether it's our friends, you know, because if you're struggling right now, my heart goes out to you. I wish you nothing but strength and security and health, whatever it is you need the most. And and know that people are watching and that you inspire people with your grit. You inspire people with your with your grace. And um and yeah, it's not life is is certainly not 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 easy it's been we go through these challenging times but i would say that and you've heard me say this before but i'll use the cocoon as an example that life is like a cocoon that if a cocoon is broken by an outside force you know then life ends but if it's broken by an inside force life begins you know this could be a political philosophy though too because look at you know we've taken so much direction from the government during this past month and now we're getting um the stimulus package which I was in favor of, but it could be argued that, Hey, if we, if we depend too much on stimulus to get our second lives going, you know, our new normal going, once this ends, then that's not going to be 
so good personally, even though it, it might be a buffer, it might be a band aid societally. It's not the cure. And then, and maybe what it is is that it stimulates because I people are in need, and it allows them, you know, gives them some breathing room to to build something, and you know, and to create something and position themselves in a way. But um, and so my my my, my message here this whole time is that we take responsibility. You know, that responsibility will give you give you more options. It'll give you more power to make things better. And because as that life comes out of that cocoon, or life comes out of that egg, you know, is that we have greatness. I really do believe we have, you know, amazing things inside of us. And that's why I'm so passionate about this, these kind of conversations, you know, and I want to thank you for, for, for bringing these messages of, of, of you know, practical things because people need hope. They need, they need help right now. And, it, and it's a bit, in my opinion, it's a better alternative to feed your brain with these kind of conversations, you know, with, with these kind of books and podcasts, you know, and, and just having some kind of of balance, you know, and so, balance is a loaded word, but choose. So let me, let me ask you, uh, so, so by the way, just to summarize the, the five C's, which I really believe in, uh, clarity, which, which I would describe as, you know, set aside time. So you can ask yourself what your possibilities are, as opposed to just being afraid all day or watching news all day or whatever it is you're doing that's making you unhappy. So clarity, uh, uh, care, contribution, create, and, and capability, which is, you know, go, feel the pleasure of getting on a learning curve, which always feels good. It kind of triggers that, that dopamine when you learn a new skill and that skill could be anything like my, my daughter, she's been watching break dancing videos and while during this period and learning how to break dance. So, or, or there's a lot, there's plenty of things out there. It's just, you have to, like you said, schedule the time to do it. Let me ask you this, Jim, during, during this period, has there been a moment where you just like something was frustrating to you or you were disappointed in something or you got scared where you just kind of broke down a little bit? Um, I mean, certainly again, like I'm not, I'm not perfect and nor do I profess to be, you know, I lean into the stuff I teach because it's what works for me and, and clients that some of them you've read in the beginning of this, of this episode. Um, challenging times, like my, my, my fear goes to just family, you know, their health and their well being, you know, and so I, I have, um, aging parents I care for dearly, you know, you know, and, uh, and are very susceptible. So my, my fears go there. And so I'm human like anybody else, you know, I've been launching this book. I, I waited 28 years to come out with this book. So it's interesting it's time for the book to be released because I had 20 speaking engagements in front of, let's see, almost 50,000 people cumulative. And that was a big way that I was going to share this book. Um, and that totally got hijacked. Every single one of them was canceled. So that was just not, I didn't cheer when that happened, but I centered myself and I thought, okay, I can't control this. What do I have control over? You know? And so then I focus on that because it's just not productive because I get no points for just, you know, ruminating on all the things that could have been you know, one way, because I can't, I can't change it. And so I just feel like it's a waste of energy. It's a waste of time, you know, shame on me. And also I want to be an example for people around me. So I just, you know, I pick myself up and I just say, okay, if I have to start over completely, you know, that a lot of planning and team and energy and effort went into putting those together, you know, what can I do now? And ask myself creative questions like, hey, how can I reach as many people, you know, doing something virtually? And that's when I do like these, these live streams and focus on podcasts and, and be more creative. And, you know, even though I'm limited, quote unquote, and getting on a plane and going places and, you know, did some doing some traditional media because they're all reporting on this. So that was, that wasn't, you know, the best news ever, but, um, you know, but again, this is life and we yeah. just try to, we make the, we, I mean, we could see, we could wish it something different, but I'd rather people see it the way it is and then do what they can to make it the way they want it to be. And so part of that limitless process, you know, I also had the option of moving this book launch to the fall, but I, you know, I told everyone that, no, we're going to launch it now because this is more than a book on speed reading, learning languages and remembering people's names. This is about mastering your mind. This is about regaining your focus and productivity when you're home. This is a, about helping your kids and being productive mm -hmm. and focused, you know, um, and doing the things you need to be able to do and overcoming these perceived limits. And so I feel like when people get this book or they gift this book, they're giving people permission to get their power back, 
you know, it's an extension of this, of this conversation. And so I'm, I'm on a mission. This is, you know, this since we first met, like I grew up with as the boy with a broken brain. So my mission is to build better, brighter brains to leave no brain left behind, no brain left behind. And so I'll do it in any way, whether it's a podcast or a book or, you know, a video or, you know, anything. I just want people's brain because this controls everything because you get your, you, you upgrade, people upgrade their phones and their apps more than they upgrade their brain. If you get oh, your brain, that's so true. if you get your brain right, your mind will follow, you know, your mindset will follow, your attitude will follow. And that, that, that's my passion. And my, my passion is learning. I feel like your passion is what lights you up. It could be stand up. It could be, and it's not limited to one thing, right? I don't think we're predestined for one passion. I think you give yourself enough stimulus and novelty and see where your, your heart goes, your mind goes when it wanders. And then, you know, what light, that's what lights you up and your purpose is what lights other people up. So my passion is learning and my purpose is teaching people how to learn. I think and it's Jim, I want to, um, I want to emphasize that we're going to be talking about your book. Uh, you know, so your book's coming out. Right now, the, the the launch date is supposed to be April twenty eighth. Uh, we'll we'll see what Amazon does, what your publisher does, and so on. But we're going to be talking about the book, and it's it's such a fascinating book. We're going to be talking about it in the next podcast that we do, which will come out in a couple of weeks, closer to your book's time. This podcast focuses on uh, the five ways you can enhance your brain during this lockdown or quarantine. But this is completely, and and everybody should go out and. Pre-order Limitless by yeah. Jim Quick, K-W-I-K. Yeah. James, uh, it's a, tell people how to do it real, real fast? Yeah, yeah, So absolutely. If, if people enjoy this conversation and they they really want to be able to be creative and have clarity and, and level up their capabilities, when you go to limitlessbook.com, even though the book's not, it is available this month, so it'll be coming shortly. It, I created this 10-day program to, to becoming limitless. And so for those of you who want a small, simple step, for the whatever $18 on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever the book is, I gift you a 10 day program to coach you through this process of mindset and overcoming procrastination and doing the things so that when you get the book, you're gonna read the book. And then I created a four week book club based on the four sections of the book. So after you receive it, we're gonna do a video and do a week on every single chapter, on every single section. So I show you how to remember it and apply it. And that's my that's my dharma, which is in my mission. So limitlessbook.com. And I would challenge everyone actually to screenshot this episode because one of the fastest ways to actually, again, put your attention on somebody else is to share and teach. And so I, I would challenge everybody to screenshot this episode, tag James, tag myself on social media. Um, I'm at Jim Quick and share your just one thing you got out of this. With what out of those five C's, what are you going to put some attention to that maybe you haven't shined a light there yet? or one aha moment you got here. And that way you're sharing it with somebody else and maybe they see it and they feel inspired to listen to this episode or, or take your advice. And um, I'll actually send a galley. I have a handful of galleys left. I'll actually send, a, I'll repost a couple of my favorites and I'll send a, a signed galley to uh, to one person just as a thank you for listening to this episode. So, and and Jim, thanks so much for for coming on today and helping us all kind of, deal with this sort of this, an event that never happened before in history, really, where the entire globe just sort of, uh, is, is essentially shut in at the moment. And on the positive side, we're all moving towards this goal of eliminating this virus, but it's a very difficult time. And, and you really provided a lot of great advice about how not to be addicted to the misery of it or the anxiety of it and how you can actually instead move forward, uh, as a result of this time. And just as a sneak peek into our Limitless podcast, where we talk about your your book, first go to limitlessbook.com, where not only uh, can you access the ordering of the book, but you can also access your your ten day program and uh, four week book club. But the, a little sneak peek, we're going to talk about mindset, methods, and motivation mm -hmm. when we talk about your book, uh, Limitless. And I'm so excited for that. So once again, Jim, thanks so much for coming on. People, uh, this is a sneak preview. People are going to see you again in a couple of weeks on the podcast, but this is, this is very much needed right now. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, my friend.